To what purpose was the Holy Spirit given to you is my title. To what purpose was the Holy Spirit given to you? Now, I want to tell you before I start. <clears throat> the Bible said if you, if, you have, if you have not the Spirit, you're none of His. You can't be saved without the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. Do you understand that? We've got to fully understand that all salvation, all changed hearts is the work of the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit in hearts. So you can't say, I don't know the Holy Spirit. If you're saved, you know the Holy Spirit. You've had his work in your heart. So don't excuse yourself. I, I've preached sometimes on the Holy Spirit. Where people said, well, I don't think I have the baptism of the Holy Ghost like you would describe it, Brother Dave, or, or people in your church. So I think I'll just sit back and relax. That's for spirit, so-called spirit-filled people. Well, I want you to know nobody can get away from this word this afternoon because if you're saved, you have the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your heart. To what purpose was the Holy Spirit given to you? Was there any advantage to it? Or has it been to no advantage whatsoever? Heavenly Father, you put this simple, simple message on my heart for the body of Jesus Christ here and Broadway and Times Square Church and for those who may hear it on tape. But I pray for a special anointing of the Holy Spirit. Oh God, come upon me now. Give me a sanctified mind, a clean heart, a pure vessel. Let the words flow from your very heart. Let me be just a channel. Lord, we take your authority over every hindering spirit, over everything that would block the mind and the heart from receiving. Lord, I thank you that through prayer you do speak to your servants. You call shepherds, you call pastors, you call evangelists. Lord, you call us to a certain work, and you've called me to a pastoral message today, and I pray, Lord, that in its simplicity it will find its place in our heart. Lord, we humble ourselves before you and we ask for the unction and the anointing that makes the word life-changing. Don't let it fall to the ground, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> to what purpose was the Holy Spirit given to you? I want you to picture with me for a moment that marvelous scene on the Mount of, of uh, Translation when Jesus is taken up into the heavens. Now, these disciples who gathered still don't get it. They still don't understand. They're still shocked and surprised that he's not set up his earthly kingdom here on earth. That's what they thought he came to do, to drive the Romans out of Jerusalem and out of Judea, out of Israel, and set up a kingdom. And they all were going to have a very important place in this kingdom. They're still thinking that way when they stand watching him ready to depart. His closing directions had been to them, tarry at Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. Said, you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And you know what they're saying to him? Even though these are his last words, he's about to ascend to the Father and to the glory. And they've just heard that the Holy Ghost is going to come upon them. And they're still saying, Lord, will thou at this time Restore again the kingdom of Israel. In other words, you are not going to be king. You're not setting up the earthly kingdom, but are you empowering us to do that now? Are we going to be the prime minister? Who's going to be uh, ruler? And they're still thinking, are you setting up your kingdom at this time? They totally missed it. These disciples didn't understand Christ's message that his kingdom was not of this earth. It was a spiritual kingdom. It was set up in the hearts and the minds of individuals, a spiritual kingdom. They're still thinking physical kingdom. They're still thinking Roman soldiers. They're still thinking about taking power and authority in the flesh. Now, Jesus, before he left, gave some wonderful, marvelous promises. Remember, he said, my peace I leave with you. My peace I'm giving to you. That's an uh, incredible statement. He said, you haven't known the kind of peace that I'm going to bestow upon you now through the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you my peace, the peace that has maintained me through my ministry here, the peace I've had all my time as incarnate in the flesh. I'm giving it to you now. And then he says, I I'm going to be with you and I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. Wonderful promises. But the most wonderful promise of all 
is that they were going to receive the Holy Spirit. He said, it's important, it's expedient that I go away, because if I don't go away, I can only be with a number of you. My kingdom is going to expand. There are going to be millions of you, like the sands of the sea. It's going to be all over the world. I can only be at one place at one time, but it's expedient. It's important that I go, and I am going to take of my spirit, because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. He is the Spirit of Christ. I'm going to take of my spirit so that I am not going to walk with you. I will not be beside you, but I will be in you. I will be with you. You're going to see me again, but you're going to see me in the inner man. I am going to be poured out upon you, and all the resources that I have are going to be in you. You won't have to come and talk to me. You won't have to walk beside me. I am going to be in you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'm going to come and live in your body. I'm going to live in you. Now, Jesus had spent, what, three years with these disciples, and uh, they didn't understand. They were not comprehending. In fact, Jesus says there's many things. If you go to, to John, the 16th chapter, you might just go there and leave it open because I'll be referring to this, go to John, the 16th chapter, if you will, please, <clears throat> or the 14th chapter. I'm sorry, it is the 16th chapter. John 16, 14th is good on the Holy Ghost also, I'll be referring to that, but right now, go to the 16th chapter of John, if you will, please. <clears throat> now, let's, uh, I just want you to read with me. Uh, verse begin at verse seven. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. When he's come, he'll reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have many things to send to you, but you cannot bear them now. Now, look at me, please. This is an amazing statement. Isn't it, isn't it something? Who, who could have been more intimate with Jesus than these disciples? They, they ate with him. They walked with him. They talked with him. They slept with him. He taught them many, many things. He, they saw miracles. Uh, he, he told them of the Father. He taught them to pray. Uh, he washed their feet. He told them eternal values and, and He's saying there's so many things I I want you to know, so many things I want to teach you, but you can't grasp them. It's not within your power to understand. No matter what I would tell you, no matter how deep I want to take you, you don't have the capacity to understand. You don't even understand the spiritual kingdom. You're not understanding the rudimental, fundamental truths that I'm trying to get into your heart so that you can carry on my kingdom, my spiritual kingdom. But he said, nevertheless... However, there's something going to happen. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. My Spirit is going to come upon you. Verse 13, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath in mind, Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and will show it unto you. Now look at me, please. Jesus, I, I, I really know in my heart why he could leave them now and with such joy leave them on earth and ascend to his Father and to his former glory. He's leaving with great joy. Can you imagine the anticipation, the joy of our Savior as he's going back to the Father? But you see, Jesus knows what these men face. He knows what his church is going to face. He looked down the corridors of time in his, in his holy mind, and he saw the coming persecutions. He saw all the Roman empires that would destroy multitudes of them. He saw the viciousness of those who thought they'd be doing God a favor by killing his own disciples. He knew they would be beheaded for the sake of the gospel. They would be slandered and maligned. They would be called the scum of the earth. He knew that they would be crucified upside down. He knew there would be despair. He knew all the crisis and the problems his disciples were facing. Yet he could leave them with great joy and expectancy. 
because he knew. He knew that he was leaving. He was sending the Holy Ghost who would have all the resources that they would ever need, all the power, all the glory, all the might that they had. Every resource as if Jesus walked side by side with them, lived in their house, slept with them, walked with them, talked with them. They would have all the resources that were in Christ. He says, all things that the Father hath in mind, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. He will have resident in him every resource that is in me. As the son of the living God, these resources are going to be in you. You may not be able, I may not deliver you from being beheaded. You may lose, take the spoiling of your goods, your house, your family may be taken from it. But I am going to have in you such a spirit of grace and such power that you will not fold up. You will not have to give in. You will not have to uh, die in despair because I'm going to give you grace. I'm going to give you grace to face any situation, any crisis, financial, physical, spiritual, mental. I'm going to give you everything you need. I'm sending you the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. What a wonderful, wonderful gift. <clears throat> Beloved, the disciples had the law of Moses. They, they had Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They had the Psalms. They had the prophets. <coughs> and yet they do not understand. They are not comprehending. They're not grasping. Jesus is saying, and they had Christ who was the living word. And even though they had the living word, they were not comprehending. And, and the Lord seems to say, I'm not going to take you any further than this. There's something more that's needed. Folks, I want to tell you, I want to make a statement and hear it, and hear it well in your inner man. This word, this word of God is a living word, but it cannot be comprehended. It cannot be understood without the work and the ministry of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit has to bring it to life. The Holy Spirit is, is, we, we say the letter killer. That's speaking of the law of Moses. It's not that this scripture is a dead book. This book is full of life. But for you and I to understand it, the life that's in it, to be uh, injected into us, that we be begin to comprehend it, it's because we must have, we need the Holy Ghost to open our eyes. I, I have heard ministers preach sermons that were theologically very correct, the man very serious, the word preached with with uh, fervor and sincerity, and it's very evident the man has done his study and his homework, he's, he's had his theological background, he gets up, and the word sounds good, it's proper, but it doesn't move you. It, 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 I, I said, well, that, that was all right, but it didn't do anything for me, it didn't change me, it didn't stick with me, because it was not under the unction, it did not have with it the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I have pastors write to me almost weekly. Confessions. One dear, uh, I was going to name the denomination, I won't name it. But this dear pastor wrote to me a loving letter. He, he said, Brother Dave, I feel like I'm just an empty uh, echo in the pulpit. He said, I study, I pray, I seek the Lord, I am sincere. And I get up and the words just seem to fall right down in front of me. There's no life. There's no power. It, it, it doesn't even affect me. I'm just saying words I hear echo out of my mouth. And folks, the reason for that is because the man has not been, he has not been moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. He has not been under the unction and the anointing of the Holy Spirit to make that word come to life. Only life produces life. If there's death in me, I can't give you life. If I don't have the Holy Ghost, if I'm not walking and living in the Holy Ghost, and if I'm not receiving the word from the Holy Ghost, and if I'm not preaching under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, it's not going to change you. It's not going to change anybody. It's going to be the dead letter. We must have the Holy Spirit to understand and even to live the word of God. Many things they could not understand, but the moment the Holy Ghost came upon them, they understood it. Peter could stand and preach with with an understanding that just absolutely opened up. Suddenly the lights were turned on. Suddenly he understood what Jesus had been saying all these 
months that he'd been with him. The understanding was opened. Hallelujah. <coughs> he is the spirit of truth. The scripture said he will abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Now, beloved, my message is not complicated at all. I simply want to uh, persuade you this afternoon how very personal the giving of the Holy Spirit is, how very personal it is. <clears throat> Most Christians do not know the Holy Spirit in an intimate, personal way. They talk about being intimate with Jesus, but they do not know what it means to be intimate with the Holy Spirit. And you cannot be intimate with Jesus without the ministry of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is the one who produces the intimacy. He's the way maker into the intimacy of Christ. He doesn't speak of himself. He speaks of Christ. He opens Christ. He brings to remembrance everything about Christ. How can you be intimate with Jesus without being very intimate with the Holy Ghost? To, to most Christians, the Holy Ghost is like a cosmic, impersonal atmosphere who wastes around in and out of your life. It's like a perfume. Sweet perfume that comes and goes. If you say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, he's gone. But he, they, they, they see him, he is a spirit, but they, they, he is also the third person of the Godhead. He has a personality. And he lives in places. And folks, this is the place he lives, in our temple. It's called the temple of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> to what purpose was the Holy Ghost given to you, and to what advantage in your life. Many who claim to be in and of the Spirit have really had no real effect. They live like other people. They, some, they, they have as much wretchedness and miserableness as anyone else on the job. They go to church and they don't understand. They're just as dead as anybody else. And they claim to be baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. But I ask you, to what advantage? That's the purpose of my message. It's true that most Christians believe that he's doing a great work in the earth. You know, that he has come to reprove the world, the great big globe. He's come to the planet to reprove the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment. And they're not a Christian anywhere who doesn't believe the Holy Ghost is at work. In Manchuria, in little villages, the Holy Ghost is moving in little towns and mountain villages. And, and some most innocent uh, little Christians are having great revivals in Manchuria. We believe that God is moving in Afghanistan in those little village churches, in the little hideaways. We believe that the Holy Ghost is working in India and in China, thousands and even millions being converted. We, we believe that... He's in Iraq right now. I know the Holy Ghost is in Iraq. If you've just been listening to the news, Saddam's own son, uh, son-in-law has just escaped and three other members of that so-called royal family and they say they escaped because they're going to bring Saddam down. The Holy Ghost just moved in there, blew him out and God's changed. God, the Holy Ghost is in charge of all the kingdoms of the earth. You know that. You know what some people don't understand? Oh, I'm so glad the Lord taught me every war, everything that's happening on the globe right now has to do with God's eternal interest with his church. Everything. See, God, God moves nations. He moves presidents. He moves kings just to take care of his little flock. Everything that's happening has to do with God's spirit with his flock. All these world leaders getting together thinking, what are we going to do? And why are we doing this? Why are we doing it? They don't understand why they're doing it. It's all God is mo moving and manipulating and planning because he's protecting his bride. Every war, every major happening on the face of this earth is the Holy Ghost taking care of his bride. <coughs> now, we, we know... In 1973, there was a lady named Norma McCorvey. She became the symbolic plaintiff in the abortion rights case. Roe versus Wade, remember? She, she, was, she was the Jane Roe. Did you see the papers today? She got saved. <laughs> <laughs> so in 
she was walking uh, past the playground, and the playground was empty, and there were three or four swings, and they were just swinging in the wind, and there were no children, and, and, and terror struck her heart. She said, they're killing all the children. No children in the playgrounds. The Spirit of God came on her, and she was led to Christ, and now she's joined the fight against abortion. Amazing. The Holy Ghost. Oh, see how we marvel at the work of the Holy Ghost in the world? Oh, she, Madeline Mary O'Hara. She was the one who successfully drove prayer out of our American schools. President of the uh, Atheist Society of America. But the Holy Ghost, she couldn't keep the Holy Ghost out of her own house. Holy Ghost went in her own house, saved her son, and he's preaching Christ. <laughs> The Holy Ghost moved into the Kremlin, blew the Kremlin away, pulled down the Iron Curtain. Now he's flooding the Russian front and everybody all over Russia. Bibles are pouring in. Our people are over there right now. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. We marvel at that. We see in the wonder what the Lord's doing in, in the world. But folks, we are missing the personality, the, the, the very personalness of the Holy Ghost. He was given to you. He was given to me. He was not just given to the world to come as some impersonal spirit to move on nations and peoples. He was given to you. Listen to what the scripture says. How clear the comforter will come unto you. The father will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. You will know him. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. He will guide you. He will show you things to come. I will send him unto you. You. Until you grasp that. The Holy Ghost is at work in the world, but he's mine. He is mine. He's my guide. He's my teacher. He's my comforter. He's in me. In John's revelation, all seven churches of Asia were birthed by the Holy Spirit. They're living in the dispensation of the Holy Ghost. It was the Holy Ghost speaking through John to the churches of Asia. And the Holy Ghost is speaking to these churches because it says, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. It's the Spirit speaking through the pen of John. Now, this is what the Holy Spirit saw in the churches. Loss of first love, a church falling into lethargy, false doctrines creeping in, fornication, all forms of idolatry, seductive Jezebel teachings, adultery, deadness, empty forms of worship, loss of power, spiritual blindness, lukewarmness, loss of communion with Christ, wretchedness, misery. Do you have ears to hear the the Spirit on three occasions says, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. What is the Spirit saying? You read all this, but do you stop and hear the inner man? What is the Holy Spirit saying to us? He's speaking to us. What is the Holy Spirit saying? He's saying the same thing he's saying to us. I've been sent to every one of these. He was sent to every one of these Asian churches. He was sent to every believer in those Asian churches with all the wisdom, the knowledge, the power, the resources that are in Christ. They were in him. He said, I have been sent to do all things and perform all things as surely as if Christ walked with you on this earth. Why then? Is it, why are God's people leaving their first love? If he's come to lead us into all truth, why is Laodicean church and says blindness? If he has come to give us the riches of Christ, why are they poor? Why are they wretched? If we're the mind of Christ is in us through the Holy Ghost, where is the power? Why is John seeing him, the one who laid his head on his bosom? His dear friend, why does he see him now come at, walking among the seven candlesticks, which were the seven churches of Asia? And why are his eyes blazing? And why is there a sharp word, a two-edged tongue, a sword pouring out of his mouth, speaking at the church with fire and thunder? And what is he saying? What is he saying? 
these seductive teachings and the wretchedness and the misery and the poverty. <clears throat> Let me ask you a question. What if Jesus had delayed his crucifixion <clears throat> just long enough to minister for three years in these Asian churches? He, he delayed his crucifixion. He delayed the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And he travels, did Paul, to all these seven churches and he, he gave the living word. He was the word and he expounded to them. And he, he made visit after visit after visit to these seven churches. Would they have been any different? No. The scripture makes it very clear. He would have had to have ended his time with them. And he was saying, there were so many things I wanted to tell you, but you can't grasp them. They needed the Holy Ghost. They received the Holy Spirit. But to what advantage? What advantage? They had the Holy Spirit. Why did they end up in such a sad state? Why is there such incredible blindness? Christians so deceived that they thought they were near perfect. When they were absolutely deceived, they were wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. This is what the Holy Spirit's wanting to know. That's what he's asking. How is it with all the resources available? How is it that you can say that you walk and live in the Holy Spirit and you live in such poverty? You walk in such blindness. Here is Jesus saying to the seven churches, he's saying, repent, or I'll remove your candlestick. In other words, I'll take away your reason for existence. You won't even be called to church. He says to another, repent, or else I'll come unto you quickly, and I'll fight against you with the sword of my mouth. Another, he says, I'll send you into great tribulation. Another, I'll spew out of my mouth. It, did the Spirit speaking... Through John's pen, have a right to speak so sharply to his own spirit-filled people. Very. Why, why is the Holy Spirit so grieved here in the first three chapters of the Revelation of Jesus Christ? Why such grief of the Holy Spirit? Why such threats to His own church? <coughs> Lovingly, yes. Because even the Laodicean church, you know, when it says, I'll spew you out of my mouth, God wasn't eating his church. Please understand, he wasn't chewing up his church. He's not trying to digest his church. When it says in his mouth means, you know, what comes out of his mouth, two-edged sword, it's the word that is in his mouth. He's talking about people who once were in the word. He said, I'm going to spew you out. There'll be no understanding. There'll be no, uh, there'll be no discernment. He's not sending them to hell. He's not damning his people. But he, what he is saying, because in the next few verses, you say he's knocking at the door. He said, buy of me. He's knocking at the door. He's longing to come in and sup with them. He loves them dearly. There's so many being spewed out of his mouth. They're living without that. That's why so many of these manifestations that are foolish are coming into the church. They've been spewed out of the mouth of God. The two-edged sword is there no longer. They're not walking in the power of the two-edged sword. They're not walking in the spirit of his mouth. Why is the Holy Spirit so grieved here? I kept thinking, God, why are you so grieved? Why is it, it, are you speaking so sharply to the church? It's the same reason he is grieved about many of us in this church. I have grieved him in this matter. The Holy Spirit is sharply grieved with some of us sitting here right now hearing me. Here it is. They had all the is in the power of the Holy Spirit available, and they ignored him, they hamstrung him, and they went their own way, seeking their own counsel from crisis to crisis to crisis. They endured their blindness, they endured their emptiness, they endured their misery, they went from misery to misery, crisis to crisis, and did not call on the Holy Ghost, did not use him. They abandoned his power. They ignored his power. Very few Christians, when they get in trouble and when they're hard places, run, come, run immediately to the Holy Ghost. You know, I, I had a picture in my mind coming to church, uh, 
just before this service from my house. I'm going to put you in a big crusade, a great big bowl, 20,000 people or so in this big uh, amphitheater. And there's a great evangelist there who advertises himself a man of power and full of the Holy Ghost and light. And we've got all 20,000 eyes waiting to see the Holy Ghost do something through one man. They're all waiting to see all on the edge of their seat, excited. Folks, and I'm not putting this down, but they're all looking down there to watch what the Holy Ghost is doing. You know what I saw? I saw the Holy Ghost down here on stage looking up at 20,000 people, watching to see, well, what are they going to do now? Uh, are they going to tomorrow see it's just as important that I help them in their argument with their boss? And when they're leaving the house in the morning and things are all wrong, they turn to me and get grace and power for the day. Where are the 20,000 miracles on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday out there? They're looking at this one man, the Holy Ghost, looking at 20,000 people saying, I want to see not here one man. Folks, it's not enough to come and say, that was a Holy Ghost meeting. What about a Holy Ghost wake up in the morning? What about a Holy Ghost subway ride? What about a Holy Ghost lunch? What about a Holy Ghost coming home, take your wife in your arms, and a Holy Ghost kiss? And the Holy Ghost moving all day long. What's wrong with that? Why else would such an ed educated prosperous, gifted churches in Laodicea end up with so many rich and miserable, poor, blind, naked believers. How could it be but that they had ignored and not consulted and not appropriated the great power in the ministry of the Holy Ghost? And folks, that is what grieves the Holy Spirit today about you and me. That, that, that we do not appropriate this power. We're, we're looking for counselors. Some of you people are still paying $100, $200, $500, 000, getting on TWA, going here, going there to get a word from somebody. Somebody lay you down and pop you. I'm not trying to be facetious, but folks, when are you going to depend on the Holy Ghost yourself and not look for some man? We've got a problem in the church, folks. It's a big problem. We've got an ironclad covenant of the Holy Ghost that He has come to abide. He doesn't flit in and out. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. We may make Him grieve. We may make Him weep. But He said, I'm with you. I am with you till you die. I'm with you. I will minister to you. I'll minister to you. I'm available. Call upon me. But why so many... So-called spirit-filled Christians walking in utter confusion. Do you know what pastors tell me? That, 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 uh, that there, there are people are coming to them and saying, what's happening? We, we don't understand what's happening in all these manifestations. There's such confusion in the churches today. Thousands of Christians confused. They don't know what's right. They don't know what's wrong. You know what's wrong with that whole scene? Is that they have not been shut in with the Holy Ghost. They don't believe that He is their guide. That He will guide them. He will teach them. He will show them. If they'll just spend quality time with Him, they'll know it in the inner man. Nobody has to tell them. The Holy Ghost will tell you. It's not enough to say I've been baptized with the Holy Ghost. I can speak with tongues and I can prophesy. I want to hear somebody say, I appropriate Him. I use Him. I use him in my everyday life. I use him every time I get upset. <clears throat> I was just about to tell you how Brother Carter had to use him. <laughs> when his wife came home and he painted the wrong color in the kitchen. <coughs> <laughs> I've never seen you so red in my life. Okay. How about that color, red? There, there.
there, there's not a Christian here in this house this afternoon who, who would not readily acknowledge, I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. I believe he's my guide. I believe he's my friend. He's my comforter. Folks, that's lip service. We can say that so glibly. And then when we get into a hard place, we are slandered. We have a crisis financially or something else happens. We go to anybody. We run to anybody. We're in a panic. We don't know the rest that remains for the children of God. And I'm telling you, only the Holy Ghost, only relying on the Holy Ghost can bring you into that rest. Why was he given? To what advantage? That in these crises. Now, let me tell you, uh, before I close, I'm not going to preach much longer, but I've got to get to this. I want to talk to you about who grieves the Holy Ghost the most. It's not the mugger. Not the man on the street. It's not the lukewarm Christian. It's not the dead Christian. The one who wounds the Holy Spirit and grieves him the most <clears throat> is the one who has known how to walk in the Holy Spirit and have, through, through exercise, practice, have utilized the Holy Spirit, have found him faithful for years. They have taught the Holy Spirit. They know the Holy Spirit. He said, He's been in, you will know Him. And they have known Him. They have walked with Him. <clears throat> but there comes one battle too much, <clears throat> one slander too vicious, one battle too overpowering, and a weariness sets in. And up to this point, God could point to this man or this woman to, to, and say to the devil, just like he did for Joe, look at Brother Dave, or, or look at Sister McIntyre, look at Brother Brown, whatever the name may be. Look, you see, when they get in trouble, when they're in a crisis, when things go wrong, they immediately run to the Holy Spirit. They immediately draw on his inner strength. They begin to commune with the Holy Ghost. I worked with Sister Catherine Cohen for five years in the car, on the elevator, in, in the restaurants. She was always talking. Half the time, not to me. <laughs> and my wife, she's talking to the Holy Ghost. She's talking to him all the time and not some silly talk. Holy Ghost is not some silly personality. I tell you what he's going to talk to you most about how to grow in Jesus. He's going to tell you how to grow up. He's going to reveal. He show you things to come about things to come in your life about revelation. How he's going to open up your mind and till till finally the greatest joy in your life is not getting uh, winning some lottery somewhere. You shouldn't be. You win a lottery. I'll tell you one thing. I was going to say, don't give it here to the church. <laughs> I'm saying now because we've got Christians playing numbers and lottery. It, that's gambling. It's out and out gambling. Now you take that for what it's worth, but <clears throat> probably not going to be worth anything to you because you wouldn't win it anyhow. The Lord will see to that. you see there, there, there's a place in the Holy Spirit where you're finally your greatest joy is a revelation of Christ. Something, something sweeter, something more powerful. He opens the word to you. You see things you've never seen before. That becomes more important than money, clothes, cars, human love, anything else. I tell you now. I, I know it. I, I can see it before a holy God. My wife can vouch for this. The greatest joy in my life when the Holy Spirit comes and reveals something fresh about the heart of Jesus. I get ecstasy. I get excited. You can have my car. You can have my... Now, don't take me serious, but... <clears throat> Somebody go and come claim the car. <laughs> Spiritually speaking.
How many know what I mean? You, you say, Holy Spirit, I know you're my guide and I need direction and he will. If you just seek him, it'll come. Isn't it's not going to come? He's not going to send you a fortune cookie with it inside. It's, it's going to come. It's going to come to you in ordinary ways sometimes. He just block a path here, block a path, and suddenly the only doors left is the right one, and that's the Holy Ghost leading you. He will lead you in practical ways, but oh, you'll finally come to this place. <clears throat> the real advantage of the Holy Spirit in being intimate with Him is that I'm allowing Him to do what He's been sent to do. And that's all that it means to walk in the Spirit. Let Him do what he's been sent to do. To lead me into the revelation of Jesus Christ. Oh, it puts a change in your countenance. It, it puts joy in your heart. And you know you can have that on your job. You don't have to be a preacher. He wants that for every one of us. He, he wants you to be able, how be it when he, the spirit truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He shall not speak himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will show you things to come. He's going to show you things about the coming of the Lord. He's going to show you. We're going to see a lot of that tonight. About the coming of the Lord and what he's going to show us. All He shall glorify me. You can be on a job and he'll glorify you right through the, the word and the revelation. He receive of mine and he'll show it unto you. And Brother Carter was talking about taking a little Bible into to a little cubby hole somewhere on the job and reading it. And somebody's going to hear a screech and a scream. You know what it is? God spoke to you, a revelation. You come out of there smiling and everybody says, well, they won the lottery. They won the $300 ticket. Uh, something wonderful's happened. No revelation of the Holy Spirit has come. Revelation. Walking and living and moving in the revelation of the Holy Ghost. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to preach it. It's something that you get from your own heart and you ponder it. You don't go around boasting about it, but it's bringing life to your spirit, bringing life to your body and your soul. Hallelujah. Well, I better quit. To what advantage is the Holy Spirit that has been given to you are you leaning on him? Oh, folks, I talk to him every waking hour. Wake up in the middle of the night, I talk to him. Now I'm in trouble, I call on him. Where is he? He's not out there. In China, so busy, he doesn't have any power and time for you. No, 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 no. He can take care of the whole world and still count every hair on your head. <clears throat> if you're bald, every follicle, he can, <laughs> he can do it. His thoughts are so many towards you, you can't comprehend them. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad you have the Holy Ghost? Let's stand. <laughs> Hallelujah. How many of you fellows from Timothy House know you can walk every single day in the power of the Holy Ghost? Direction, anointing, comfort, strength. Power, everything you need is in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. <coughs> Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this church. You are welcome in this vessel. This is your temple. This is your body. Lord, we've got to start showing the advantage of our walk with you. There has to be an advantage. You were given, Lord, to meet every need. Oh, meet every need here. Holy Spirit, meet every need. Hallelujah. Lord, for those that are hungry, Holy Ghost has enough food to fill every hungry spot. He can fill every belly. Hallelujah. Every sadness you can drive away and restore gladness. Oh, God, for every wretchedness, every blind eye, you can open them. You can give wisdom and knowledge and 